more importantly, just see how it fits for you as an individual in this moment in time with the sort of life you're living. And that's what's so profound when you're really doing that, it is very much sort of transforming you. So a lot of things that I do go very much against the grain of everyone doing anything about China, because it's like, I'm here talking about crazy spiritual stuff and all this and transforming yourself when often it's just like a way to feel empowered. Oh, it's a big conflict or, oh, I want to know about this big country because it makes me feel powerful or this is how I'll defeat this and we'll be better and all this kind of stuff that kind of float around a more political military type circle. But the, the real question is more about what it is doing to you as a person, right? Right. And that's it. So if you're really confronting it, really confronting a real civil, I mean, China's the best thing to call it as a civilization because it's a difficult state. Like it's a, had a rough history with being a nation state to say the least. So it's a civilization. So it's like, well, you're confronting some civilization. It's a profound sort of thing. This is Unconditioning, Discovering the Voice Within, with Whitney and Jenkins. Hello, and welcome to the 34th episode of Unconditioning, Discovering the Voice Within, where I bring on guests, and we talk about the inner authentic voice and the challenges and rewards that come from following it. This week, I have with me Jason Zeftel. Jason has a podcast called China Unraveled. He is a China specialist, and he has a deep understanding of China and the Chinese economy, and he helps people understand China, our changing world, and what it means to individuals, families, and businesses. And Jason usually talks more about the economic sectors and politics throughout China. However, I wanted to have him on as a guest because I thought it was really fascinating that he has this expertise and I wanted to understand how he came about that process of finding this passion that he has in sharing this information with the world. And so we do talk a little bit about China and what is happening there in the world, but we also talk about more of the ancient spiritual roots in China, and also Jason's personal experiences, as well as travel overall and how it impacts and affects us. So I learned a lot on this episode, and I have no doubt that you will as well. And so here is Jason as we unravel China. So how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm, I'm doing well. Where are you in the world? I am in Los Angeles. Uh, extremely tropical looking Los Angeles. Okay. It's so bright behind it's so bright behind me often that I have to just block it out. And I usually do sort of less stories about me and more about what I'm more about the actual stuff I do or like me talking about the thing. Uh-huh. Uh so this will be kind of interesting. Yeah. A little and, different, yeah. Yeah, and we can definitely get to all of the things that you're doing uh, because they're certainly very interesting too. One of the things that I like to dig in first is because in order for you to be able to have this passion and do all the things that you're doing, there are a lot of things that needed to happen along the way in order for you to be where you are. And so one of the first things that I like to ask my guests is, when is the first time that you realized that you had an inner voice of your own and it wasn't influenced by anyone else or your environment or anything around you, but you knew that it was like truly you and only you? Hmm. I feel like it's something that goes back pretty far but for me the problem was more that it just seemed to appear and disappear like there'd be glimmers of it like mm -hmm. i remember being very young and remembering i had very strong opinions on all sorts of things and they were very different from other people around me right i think you sometimes get to a point though where if you're so different it's quite unclear how you fit in to things right. i think when you're a child it's hard to see how that is supposed to work you're like well this is my brain seems to be working a bit differently, yet I'm surrounded by all these other people, all these other kids, and I have to kind of go through one le level of school after another. And it kind of just forces you to absorb a lot of what the outside voice is telling you. Right. I would say for me personally, sort of the, the time I heard, reheard my voice, I guess, sort of was around when I was probably 25. Mm -hmm. And I just left graduate school. And I was just sort of seeing, I was once more sort of seeing the world as it was and everybody around me was seeing something very, very different. At that point, I was like, well, I've gone more than far enough along this train to realize that 
I don't have to see it exactly the same way. So it was just like, oh, there's freedom to sort of just let that voice speak again and not kind of be drowned out. Yeah. And were you raised in Los Angeles? I was. Okay. And so you grew up in pretty an eclectic kind of diverse environment. Did your family encourage you to explore and travel? Is that something that you always wanted to do? Or was that something that you kind of discovered on your own? No, I think they were always very interested in travel. That's definitely something that they, it was sort of like, my upbringing was very much even more eclectic. My sort of mom had traveled a lot of the world when she was young because her, my grandfather, her father was a, an economist who sort of did developmental work in India and China and other places. Oh, wow. Travel was big for her. And then my dad was an immigrant and he was born in Africa. So there's just travel in all sorts of places. A lot of my family came to the United States within a generation ago. So that like the whole family on my dad's side. So it's just sort of travel was sort of always a thing, but I was also just from a very young age, I was always traveling. I was always like escaping and running away and trying to go see things, very exploratory. So that kind of moved throughout the whole, the whole yeah. story that I'm yeah. Telling, yeah. Yeah, I used to get wanderlust um, when I was a kid pretty bad. And it was just like an aching that I needed to go and explore something beyond my current environment. And uh, so, I had to discover it on my own, though, because my family wasn't very travel-like. <laughs> mm. um, so when was it specifically that you went to China for the first time um, and this like mm. door opened for you? I was, how old was I? I was probably 19 in 2011. I went for the first time. I, yeah, I learned the language so for the first time there. I was basically studying five hours a day i was having the sounds of chinese drilled into my skull the mm -hmm. chinese language is a very different language mm -hmm. so it's not very it's not easy to learn but the process is simple it, the simple is just grueling right so you have to learn all these very different sounds these very different tones and so i did a grueling way of doing it where i was just sort of had it beat into my skull for five hours a day and then i went to china for the first time and i had the the language and i could i could hear it and see it and I got to travel all, all around for that first time. And it was really an eye-opening experience. It was really opened me up to the language and the culture in a very different way than I'd experienced because I've been interested in China for a very long time. I've been reading, I was reading old Chinese books. I've been reading histories and the architecture and all sorts of things. It was really quite <laughs> a very China-heavy childhood in a lot of ways. But the going to learn the language and going to the place was a very uh, empowering sort of invigorating experience. Yeah, do you remember what it felt like um, from learning the language before you were in China to being immersed within that? Was there something very like tangible that you were able to feel just being in the vibration of the energy of that land? Yeah, the well, first of all, it's just so much more, it's always just so much more chaotic and in your face, right? So you're learning things in a very structured environment. And you realize, oh, wow, the real world is way more complex. It's not like, oh, I have to learn, read these three words. It's like people are yelling 12 things at you at once. And there's you know, vertical, th some words are being written vertically, others are written horizontally, and it's just sort of all over the place. So there, there's definitely that, this, the pace, the sort of feeling of immediate life, I guess, was a very big change where you're reading old things, you're learning languages. It can all feel very dead and stale and sterile. But when you're in a place, particularly in sort of major cities. I entered Hong, uh, China for the first time through Hong Kong. And that was just a, you know, it's a culture, it's a culture shock. It's obviously like a really modern, big, slightly westernized city, but it's, I mean, westernized, but still very, very Chinese. And yeah, and just, I went from there through, initially through Southern China, which is in many parts of it were very, very rural, very, very the opposite of Hong Kong in a lot of ways. And so I went from these big industrial cities to, much more rustic, rural, and beautiful places. And that was also just a very big change. So not only did it move from being in a classroom and feeling like the words were stale and what was this place? And, you know, is, a thousand years ago, is it still around? And you go to a big city, it's like, wow, it's modern, it's alive. Then you go to a nature and, and suddenly you're kind of hit again with a very different sort of place. It would be like going to New York and then rolling through West Virginia in a lot of ways. Right, yeah. Um, did you go into China with any kind of assumptions? And when you 
got there, did you realize that you had some misconceptions about your cool. idea of what it would be like? Oh yeah, I have so I had so many misconceptions about China throughout my life at, at various points. It's like my whole process has been unlearning a lot of things that were just very wrong, that things that I just picked up that were wrong assumptions or things I read in the news that were wrong or, and on and on and on. So yeah, and it's, it's weird because when you're in a place, you're starting to feel like, oh, I heard X, Y, Z, but ABC that I'm seeing with my very eyes looks very, very different, right? So you're, it's, I'm hit right away with that. So immediately a lot of the poverty that I saw sort of going around along the, the trains and in areas that were far less developed and more off the beaten path. And then just the sort of basic stuff we take for granted, everything from hygiene to sanitation, mm -hmm. yeah. to electricity, to heating, everything, cooling, all the stuff we take for granted in modern life is more variable, more uncertain. And in times just very different. Like a great example is I went to a, it was in a rural sort of village and they had a bathroom and the, the way you would go to the bathroom is it was just a long uh, slanted trough, like angled downwards in the, in the hut. And it just sort of angled out into like a pit outside of it. Right. And I was sitting there, I was like, wow, not going to see that in any sort of book. Right. You're not going to see <laughs> that, that anywhere. So the, yeah, the misconceptions were everywhere. And the worst part about China is that you just, you're hearing so much about it and you have these, you're naturally creating images and you're seeing skyscrapers and you're hearing, seeing big numbers and hearing scary things. And it's just can be very overwhelming. So you go there and you're really just thrown into a hornet's nest basically. And you have to figure out what's wrong, what's right. Kind of takes a while. Yeah. Did you find that your intuition uh, kind of strengthened by having to navigate that environment that wasn't so familiar? Did you feel more connected or in tune to trusting yourself in that way? Yeah, I think that I really enjoy sort of navigating. Like I said, that exploratory stuff was very early on. It was very travel focused and even navigating whether ideas are correct, right? Whether this mm -hmm. thing we're being told is correct kind of in the modern world where everyone is sort of giving seminars and giving speeches and all that and trying to convince you of this and that it's even more important. But in China, I just actually kind of enjoyed that process, to be honest, of exploring it and saying, oh, this could be right, this could be wrong. And it kind of made it alive, right? It's the difference between a school of life and a school in a building that's sort of random in the middle of nowhere. Right. And did that experience lead you to wanting to connect with China on a deeper level and share that truth with the world? Is that how that came about? Yeah, that's 100%. So I was in China and I was there for a good amount of time and I went and came back. And the, the truth is I found that the things I wanted to know, and as I kept exploring, I realized that I couldn't even find it just in the people, right? I couldn't find it just in one city. Like China's so big in a lot of ways. I spent most of my time in Beijing in the end. And going to Beijing, learning the language, talking to people, going around, living there, whatever. It's kind of like, and thinking you know China, it's kind of like going to the United States, living in Washington, D.C., and learning English, and thinking you understand the United States, right? Mm -hmm. that, ain't, that, ain't, that ain't true. <laughs> uh, and it's even worse for China because it's so big, it's so old, it's so complex, right? So it's even worse. I just realized I had to find new ways to understand it. And I needed to find deeper ways, in particular, deeper ways, because there's a lot of not only myths, it's not only myths and misconceptions that we hear about China, this is obviously taken into a different place, but there's a lot of myths and misconceptions that Chinese have about China themselves. And a yeah. lot of it is because the Chinese political state is trying to craft, as everyone can see all around you, trying to craft a certain narrative. And it's not just because it's the Communist Party right now doing it, it's how every Chinese state has done. It's what everyone has done because there's a there are parts of Chinese history, Chinese culture, Chinese the Chinese past that is very, very dangerous for basically to, to get out and to be brought into the light. And I'm not here trying to like do that, but as I started to realize this, I was like, oh, wow, like you really have to go, I really had to go deeper to go into the past. You have to go into the agricultural era. You had to go into the ancient wars and really see things across vast spans of time. Kind of brought me back to when I was a kid and I was just learning about it for the first time and just sort of absorbing it all. Then I went there, saw what was right, what was wrong. I guess I had to come back kind of bring new patterns, new analytical tools and stuff together to try and figure out what was actually going on once the lived experience had brought it yeah. more into focus. That's very interesting. 
to think about traveling, going to another place and being able to zoom out and view it with a lens, with a bigger picture that someone within that environment and has like grown up there uh, can't see because they're so close to it. Yeah, and so that's a one really interesting thing about China. China is one of the most the countries most obsessed with its own history, right? And not in any bad way. It's just it thinks the p- history is the key to everything. And at least it did until the last couple of decades, and there's good reasons for it. But the really interesting thing is, archaeology and real history is very different from what's ever existed, right? You used to have like guys who'd write books, and we'd talk about the books they wrote, and that's like the history, it's chronicles and stuff like that. And even to this day, every year the big Chinese state newspapers, they publish the greatest archaeological findings of the year, the greatest discoveries, because there's a real sense where just in the last hundred years, China itself has started to see its own history. Mm. So this is part of the reason where when I say like, oh, there's all this propaganda or just things that are wrong. It's like, yeah, obviously, because they didn't, they just started <laughs> getting the tools, right? And no, it's, it's, that, it's a very interesting sort of piece of that, of that puzzle that you start to see, oh, well, it's all much more in flux than you realized, right? And it's much more of a place where people are pushing a certain idea of things, or and particularly in the government's idea, it's like, well, it's what we want people to think. And I think by that point, I'd sort of seen it. I'd had the, the deep interest. I'd seen it for myself. I heard even like in Beijing, I, heard, I got lectures from all sorts of crazy academics talking about how they're one child policy was necessary and they have all this planned out and this is going to totally work and this is going to work. And so I was just like, this is crazy. No <laughs> idea what you're talking about. Uh, and then, yeah, then you could sort of see it and it's, it is really empowering at some point. I think that, you know, the real motivation for all this, even though it seems like a lot of my stuff is to like debunk this or debunk that the real motivation behind it is just to try and get these sort of deeper truths to come right. out because they're not, they're not just about, Oh, uh Oh, if you let this out, Chinese people are going to be mad. Uh oh, it's more like, no, it's like a major human civilization. And what's really kind of under the rug here are some sort of really profound ideas, right? And so, unfortunately, political state and me get into a bit of a tussle because it doesn't, <laughs> we don't, we have very different opposing goals. They want like order and stability and conformity. And, and I want, uh, you know, some of the profound things that China's accomplished really in a kind of a deeper level to emerge, right? Yeah, there seems to be definite parallels also between the United States and finding out our own history and realizing that and becoming awake to uh, how things really are and also with China and the whole world, really. Um, But so what are some of the truths that you feel that you are trying to champion and uncover and share with people about China? So I'll I'll answer that. Here's Here's an interesting thing to sort of start it off, though. Well, an interesting comparison to China is always India, right? They're the two big old agricultural civilizations that have been around a long time. And India is very weird. It, instead of having the giant political state, it has this sort of more fragmented thing. And it's actually the Indian culture has swarmed into the West. All the yoga, all the chakras, everything. Right, yeah. That whole thing has just, it's just totally entered Western consciousness, particularly sort of, uh, you know, in the last 50, 60 years in a huge way, right? It's like integral to some people's identity, spirituality, everything. Right, yeah. And I mean, basically, p- part of what I'm saying is that like, well, there's obviously stuff like that in China too. And the, right. here's a really interesting thing is that there's already a secret way that it's already here. And that's basically all the all the martial arts traditions, mm-hmm. most of them, or major ones in the world come from the Northern China, the, the area in and around the North, Northern, North, the North China Plain, which is a really dark, deadly battlefield throughout history. So it developed all these martial traditions to forge the body, discipline the mind, you know, gird the soul, that kind of thing. And it, it spread around the world. So whether it's, you know, judo, it spread to Japan, it spread to South Korea, you get judo, you get Taekwondo. And then the 20th century, it went to sort of any dangerous place in the world would sort of take one of these, it took judo, went to uh, Brazil, ended up becoming Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, things like that, go to Israel to become the Israeli self-defense stuff. So this whole martial tradition mm-hmm. basically or originates in East Asia and particularly in China. So that, that's an interesting thing where it's already here in a way, but we don't quite know it. And that's just one thing, right? Uh, a lot of the other stuff is, is, is deeper. In a lot of ways, the, what, what is typically called Taoism. So yeah. everyone remember Taoism, everyone can see the yin yang, right? You, so right. you show that to a child and they're like, you can talk about, you can blab about Confucianism for like days and no one will remember anything. 
you can show a child the yin yang, he'll just like stare at it, like very like, oh wow, like it, there's mm -hmm. something very gripping about it, and it, it's actually a, a relatively important symbol for it, so it, it's important. But this whole Taoism in general is, in many ways, a shamanic tradition. It is the, it is a survival of very old spiritual traditions, and they've been extra abstracted into a very very refined form of. Uh, thought basically thought and perception about life and how things function and it's it's just that i mean there's many things in china but just that is a it's a very deep and profound sort of practice it's obviously very similar to yoga and things like and uh not yoga not hinduism the, the counterpart to yoga i keep forgetting anyway the <laughs> yoga the, the spiritual system around yoga the spiritual system yeah. and yoga all, all these things are trying yeah. to give people a better sense of the subtle body of the human uh the spirit right and how, how all this interacts with the world all that kind of stuff and really i i really i rarely get to talk about this stuff so i don't go into it too much but this stuff's very important i think also the challenges of the chinese political state so china has goes through these giant cycles of basically order and chaos throughout its history right mm -hmm. big dynasty generations of warlordism and violence and warfare brief dynasty generations of warlordism and violence and warfare and so this whole process has really really forged uh chinese culture and civilization it's also brought along with it some profound ideas about how to deal with challenge and obstacles in your life and what you what you should do what political leaders should aspire to and, and things like that so i i, I don't want to mouth off about it too much but there's a lot of <laughs> things right there's the, there's a spiritual side to it yeah. there's um there's virtue ethics there's elements of politics although nobody would obviously clearly i don't i'm not a big fan of, of the chinese political states right all the dynasties or communist party communist empires, whichever way they come. But yeah, there are these, there are, there are deeper truths. And a lot of this is about, a lot of it essentially is a philosophies of balance, right? So a lot right. of the Indian philosophies are more uh, cyclical. It's reincarnation, it's rebirth, it's renewal. A lot of the Chinese are more about balance. Yeah. And so these are particularly useful in our modern world. And it's at the highest level, it's about balancing order and chaos within your own life and within the world and within yeah. the state within the family. Yeah, specifically also energy centers too, right? Um, and incorporating, we're even incorporating things like acupuncture into this culture that's becoming more mainstream and accepted and like even being like paid for by insurance companies. So that those are- Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so Qigong, acupuncture, uh, the, the uh, Tai Chi, all the stuff, there's energy centers. And so like India has the seven chakras, China has the three Dantians, lower, middle, upper Dantian. And, and there's obviously 12 channels for acupuncture. It's a whole very complex yeah. system. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's like it's like that stuff, the Indian stuff where it's like, oh my God, it's so much. And there's a lot of value in it for sure. Yeah. And, and, and I think people should just be aware again, the martial arts traditions, I, I bring that up because it's the most relevant one. They're all rooted in all of this stuff. So people may think, oh, this is hokey. This is that, this is lame. And then you see a dude like break 30, concrete cinder blocks with his fist and you're like okay well maybe uh there's something here so that's yeah, always the one to bring yeah back. and it's all associated at the root of it with the mind and being able to navigate your mind and uh become aware and be in certain states on command yeah all, all of that really really filters in and i think again india and china are the two really old agricultural civilizations that we have they've been around we have all their writings and it's very hard to integrate them into sort of very different both western minds and consciousness and then modern minds and consciousnesses and even in china this is a major difficulty so things like tai chi basically were transformed by the communist party into morning recreational exercise for old people or something you know what i mean it's like it's everything is being shifted in the modern world. So going back to the roots of things is even more important, right? So you can hear like, you can go online and read like, oh, the seven chakras, you can learn quickly what they are. And you're like, okay. And you move on and kind of think you know it, but typically it's well, something that was studied for decades. And, right. You know, and it became a very inward, like you were saying, it's a very much a, a practice that was developed in the body over time through experience and, and sensation and feeling. Similar yeah, thing. it's a very ancient wisdom um, that we don't appreciate as much as we could, I don't think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I would agree with that. It's hard, though. It's hard to try and advocate for ancient <laughs> wisdom when the, the there's a massive sort of 
geopolitical confrontation going on. So 90% of my conversations are typically about the contours of that geopolitical confrontation. But people got to remember this stuff is, is really there and it is part of a general human legacy, right? It is, China's been the largest population center on earth for thousands of years now. And basically from the moment, ag- from the moment agriculture arrived in China, pretty soon after it was like the biggest, biggest uh, country or b- biggest uh, region by population. So it's, there's a lot of human life that is uh, been lived there, right? Yeah, absolutely. So how has China allowed you to connect with your authenticity? Hmm. I think whenever we analyze or not analyze, we experience another culture, it is always reflecting ourselves back to us. Like it's very easy to just absorb some other culture and sort of lose yourself, I guess. Like I know people who went and moved to ashrams briefly in India and they came back and they had a whole new aesthetic and that was very cool. But the little germ of themselves, that individual core seemed to have uh, drifted elsewhere in the meantime. (laughs) And it would take a little while for it to get back. So I think that other cultures actually always challenge you to maintain your individuality in the face of them, especially when they're very complex and filled with ancient knowledge and subtle wisdom. You feel like, oh, I, the real answers are here. Maybe mm-hmm. this is where I'll find everything. It sort of brings back that youth yearning for our unanswerable questions to be answered, right? We think it's here in this civilization or whatever it is. And the truth is, it's, it's not. It, there's cool stuff in there, but it has to be made for you. And you have to keep yourself in in play, right? You have to sort of keep your core alive and active and bring in what's valuable and and see sort of what doesn't fit and sort of more importantly, just see how it fits for you as an individual in this moment in time with the sort of life you're living. And that's what's so profound when you're really doing that, it is very much sort of transforming you. So a lot of things that I do go very much against the grain of everyone doing anything about China because it's like, I'm here talking about crazy spiritual stuff and all this and transforming yourself when often it's just like a way to feel empowered. Oh, it's a big conflict or, oh, I want to know about this big country because it makes me feel powerful or this is how I'll defeat this and we'll be better and all this kind of stuff that kind of float around a more political military type circle. But the the real question is more about what it is doing to you as a person, right? right. And that's it. So if you're really confronting it, really confronting a real civil, I mean, China's the best thing to call it as a civilization because it's a difficult state like it's a had a rough history with being a nation state to say the least so it's a civilization so it's like well when you're confronting some civilization it's a profound sort of thing right and can easily can easily swamp you but if you can sort of have a core it, the, the challenge is really that we have to know ourselves to even try and do it right right i think that's sort of where it goes and yeah maybe maybe that little exploratory stuff when i was young gave me a bit of confidence something in the childhood or whatever it was, or, or you just have your back against the wall and you feel like, well, I got to be me now. I got to figure it out. Otherwise I'll get swamped by life, by my job, by some relationships that have become dead or unintentional or, or whatever it is, or by large group forces like civilizations and nations that will just uh, drown me out. So it's all very challenging. It's always a struggle as far as my life experience is concerned. <laughs> I think probably everyone's. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so knowing all that you know from all of the immersion that you've done with China and the studying and living there and being there and breathing there, what do you feel is happening right now as far as everything going on within the world and where do you see things going? Oh, okay. Uh, I will try and keep my tone very more... <laughs> intimate and conversational instead of more like <laughs> hugely abstract and intense. But in general, the the world that we've sort of known for a few decades is evolving into something new, right? So some things that were part of the old world are being shed and some new things that we don't quite yet know or understand are sort of being born. And in many ways, China is part of that old world even though it's only been 50 or so years, China was really the key to this globalized world that we developed, you know, starting in the seventies, eighties, right? Jobs left places like West Virginia in part, Mm -hmm. they went to places like China. And there's obviously problems with that whole story, but that whole arc of history is coming to an end. And that's a major theme. So for anyone listening, 
that deglobalization is what we're really seeing right now. When you see supply chains clogged all around the world, you see product shortages, you see new conflicts between all sorts of countries. You see in, you know, in Europe, you see Russia in Europe fighting over Ukraine, Russia threatening to t- turn off the gas tap so Europe wouldn't be able to heat itself in the winter, all these sorts of things. Every country is becoming more protectionist. They want to make their own goods. The, the pandemic exposed a lot of vulnerabilities mm-hmm. that we all had. We had all these interdependencies that became dependencies that were <laughs> frightening, right? right? And these trends were going on beforehand, but they've just been really accelerated. And so you have this deglobalization phenomenon, and then you have depopulation, actually. You have populations around the world, uh, cultures, demographies that are no longer self-sustaining. So the population of Italy is going to have in you know 30 or 40 years. And the people that remain are going to be very old. Yeah. There's no longer babies. So I was recently in Greece. You'd be astonished to see how few children there are just wandering through any city in Greece, except for Crete. There was actually a good amount of children in Crete. But you go to Athens, you go to other major cities, there's no children anywhere. There's dogs. And that's really fun and cute for a while. But then what we're seeing now, there's real problems with that. And so the China side to this is, well, you're the, you're the house that globalization built, right? All the factories, right. everything. And then you're also, you've, you have a ticking time bomb because you have 30, what, 40 years of uh, one child policy at this point. So their, depop- their population bomb is a, is a nuke. It's basically what, the way that works uh, when you've been kind of sort of 40 years ahead of the game. And so all this is a real challenge. And a lot of the ways we're talking about things are just kind of behind, behind the eight ball, right? So we're all struggling to see how, how, what's going on and deal with the current crisis. And it's very hard to sort of see where things are going a bit farther down the line. I think uh, one of the reasons I can sort of mouth off about this and feel pretty <laughs> confident is just yeah. because I spent years writing this book, obviously doing all the stuff in China, all the other work I've done, and then actually condensing it into a book to make it um, sort of intelligible to people. And I was already kind of saying this stuff is going to happen. So then it's, while it's happening, uh, I, I started, the reason I started the podcast is because I had just finished, I have, a, you know, so I have a podcast called China Unraveled, and the pan, I basically finished the first chapter of my book, January, 2020. I was like, great, time to edit it, revise it, send it out. And then within weeks, uh, pandemic hits. And I'm like, huh. Pandemic just popped out of China, right? The whole, everything, you know, it's all it's all a mess. And so I was like, okay, I'll make a podcast to try and describe some of what's going yeah. on so, so people can understand. And that's kind of the challenge now where it's, there's so many things changing that it's just one of those periods of serious flux. So the balance of order and chaos, so you use some China stuff, the chaos is up and the chaos is obviously very destructive, but it's also the creative force, right? It is, it's, you know, the, the classic Chinese adage is, you know, in within every crisis, there's an opportunity, right? right. And obviously anyone who's lived has also seen that, right? <laughs> yeah. But it's just, it's so, it can be very emotionally destabilizing, the lack of stability. Uh, we see flights to security, both in our personal lives, our political systems, all that kind of stuff happens. But overall, it's just, it's going to be a period of major change this decade in particular. A lot of things that we think we've known aren't, aren't going to be the same. Yeah, it feels a lot like a breakdown, breakthrough type of situation where we have to kind of get comfortable being uncomfortable for a while um, so we can come out on the other side. Yeah, I think that's a really good way of putting it. And I think anybody, everybody, we all were waiting for 2019 to come back, waited a year, that didn't happen. (laughs) Now it's two and now we're going into year three. It's like that ship has sailed (laughs) and now we have to figure out uh, where we are and that's a challenge. So I'm trying to, a lot of the stuff I'm doing, I'm trying to communicate some of that, trying to make it, even though obviously it's a chaotic period, having a bit uh, of the way, the waypoints, the guideposts to see where, why things are, you know, wh- why they were the way they are, why they're starting to change. It's all very helpful just to get people a bit more grounded because obviously we all need to seize opportunities, but you can't just be living in eternal flux, right? It just doesn't, right. It's, a, it's like, oh, so what about my child? Like, what about my you know, the business, <laughs> right? It's just, it's all too much. So actually giving people a platform to understand why things are happening, why they're happening. And then, you know, some action plans for what to do and where to look, what to look for. That's all really important. So I do some, you know, advising and consulting for individuals and businesses, mm-hmm. businesses, because, oh God, I have all my production in China. Oh God, you know, right. all my investment has come from there, that kind of stuff. And then for individuals, it's like, well, the world's really changing. Like where, where do you live? What industry do you work in? 
Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what do you do when we have a world without population growth and you can't just bet that your products are going to have more people to buy Huggies, you know, more people to buy dish, you know, dish soap. What, what if there's just less of everything? It's a, it's a whole, it's one of those things that's so big, you know, it's like so big, <laughs> you, you, you don't want to do it. So I'm always trying to make it sort of smaller, bite size and intelligible. I hope it helps people, but that's right. Break, what did you say? Breakthrough? Uh, Break, a breakdown for a breakthrough. Breakdown yeah. for a breakthrough, at least for the United States. I think that is definitely true. Other yeah. places, China, China, China has real problems. Europe has real problems, but the United States, if we, you know, get our stuff together, it could be a breakdown to break through. Yeah. Do you see any like small glimmers of light or hope for uh, China or? Here's the interesting thing. When I was first interested in China, I was just, it was pure, sheer childhood fascination and curiosity, right? That's how it started. And then after around 9-11, uh, Iraq, those wars and Middle Eastern wars, I started to think, uh oh, our country looks like it doesn't have the sharpest uh, grasp of many regions of the world. It's happy to just go in there, blow them sing things up, kick up dust and sort of leave. <laughs> and that's sort of the end of it. And I was very worried. I was like, well, what, what if a similar thing happens to China? And so I spent a lot of time trying to figure it out. And initially I was like, okay, well, we've got to make sure we can win against China. Then I learned more and I realized, huh, I don't think China's going to win. And then I realized, okay, so could they win? And I tried to figure that out. And eventually what happened is the it was like, oh, the kind of a warrior posture, like try and figure this out. And then you're like, oh, maybe I can help them, right? Like maybe, maybe they actually still need help, which is part of the US government still thinks that way. And then you realize, and now I've, I've really come to the point where the problems are actually, I think are so severe mm -hmm. that this, you know, it, it's, it's the, the things that China would have to do to fix things are all heinous, if that makes sense. Yeah. Right. It's, you know, you have massive surveillance state. There's more cameras in China, public surveillance cameras, than there are people in the United States. There are, just to keep the population going, uh, to keep, you know, political dissent uh, down. I mean, this, this, is, this is brutal, right? This is an authoritarian mega state empowered with all the modern digital tools of uh, our era. So even though, I, to be honest, I don't even think that's going to work. So I think even if they try all of that, it's still not going to be enough, which is just an uh, insight into the scale of the problem, right? So too much to get into, but yeah, it's, it's a tough one and I don't think so. And, you know, basically since the 19th century, uh, the British, they got into war with uh, China and they actually realized that they could break China into pieces. So they could have divided China in the 19th century, about around 1850, they could have said, hey, Southern China and Northern China, we're going to split you, split mm -hmm. you down the middle. And they could have made that work. Uh, and basically around that period. China is now, its population is so large, right? Because they're growing throughout time. It's just getting bigger and bigger. Now it's at 1.2 to 4 billion people. It's getting to the point where Humpty Dumpty might not be able to, you might not be able to put them back together again. Uh, that's where things are going. When you run out of population, when you run out of, particularly when you run out of women, right? Because that's, that's the way population <laughs> works. It's And there's a huge gender and sex imbalance in China. I don't know if people know, but there's 40, there's a California sized population of men that can't find spouses because there's a preference for men. There's a whole history to that, which is probably not worth getting into, but there's that. And now you're living with all these realities. That's the problem right. for China. It's like energy systems messed up, finance systems messed up, uh, gender and demographics are messed up. Uh, you go through every sector. It's like, can you manage all of it at once? Right. It's like, if you, you could handle one, but what if you have to handle all of them as they all start to break down? And that's the way things tend to happen in Chinese history. So wow, that's really I'm not betting against it. Yeah, that's really, really fascinating because we were just talking about how um, China's like ancient wisdom like holds balance as its whole key, and they're really off balance in all of those areas. Even I better, that the reason China advocates but it's it's all focused on balance is actually because it's never been able to find that balance. That's why it's obsessed with it. So just the, the yin yang in general, it's, it's supposed to be a symbol of an ideal balance, right? Of you know, positive, negative, male, female, light, dark, <laughs> order, chaos, yeah. whichever duality you want to pick. And it, it's, so, it's, so, it's so enthralling to China and alluring because that is the balance they are, have never been able to find, hmm. ever. And it's finding that balance. It's striving for that balance that has built a lot of these things I was talking about that are so valuable. It's sort of in the spiritual back end of the yeah. political, geopolitical <laughs> front end of China. Uh, and it is that striving, right? So we see the striving today as build these cities, 
build the ports, build the factories, build, 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 make it, make it, make it, make it, make it. And that's also trying to balance against these same forces that are spiraling, you know, up yeah. and, and out of control. Yeah. And that's also very like talking about like divine feminine, divine masculine. Those are all super, very masculine traits of like building and structure. And then like there's way more men than there are women. So it seems like maybe they have to go through all of this to realize where they're off balance. And so they have to go down. <laughs> maybe I wouldn't bet on a feminine or feminist <laughs> revolution at all in China in any way. Uh, yeah, that's unlikely. And part of the reason, again, why there's such a, uh, a miss an imbalance there is because the the natural world, the Chinese geography, the landscape, all of these things are, are where a lot of the problems originate, right? Way obviously way back in the day, right? feeding people, dealing with natural disasters, all these sorts of things were the challenge. And the feminine, in a sense, is connected with nature as right. well. And so mm -hmm. the state is opposed to nature. And, you know, in the political world, that ends up as a massive, like, I mean, patriarchy, obviously, there's things called Han chauvinism, you might have heard that where there's basically been a basically very male oriented culture in China for, forever. The emperor was both Caesar and, you know, you know the Pope, in, historically. You had a thousand years of foot binding for women uh, as well. And it is, I, I'd, I'd say this is also an area where it's not, the reason it, it goes, it trends so far to the order male side of the spectrum is because the, uh, as far as it's concerned, the feminine, the, 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 the more chaotic creative side uh, is too, too much to handle. <laughs> that is one way to think about it. And again, you see that when you're binding when you're controlling, when you're always doing that, where, you know, where is the, the threat? Where is the power really held? So obviously that's weird. I'm connecting nature and politics and all that with, with male and female, but it is if, to use the broad extra actions to cover thousands of years of history. It's broadly correct. Yeah. I don't, I don't think that's weird at all. Um, I see the connection and the thread for sure. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so, so I'm going to connect something with nature too, um, because it has to do with nourishment and food. And so, what is something that stood out to you when it comes to like food and nutrition in China compared to how it's presented here in the cuisine that is shared with us, like Chinese food? Yeah, so American Chinese food is like an American creation of the 20th century, a lot, but like Chinese entrepreneur immigrants who are sort of molding Chinese foods to American preferences over the decades. So it's basically like a different thing. And also there's so many regions in China so a lot of the right. food we're familiar with, there's a there's Sichuan food. You've probably seen that S Z, you know that kind of one. Yeah, that's uh, that one. That's a, a big region in China. There's that food, but there's a lot of different varieties. And in China in general, uh, rice is. I mean, a lot of it is that there's there's been real real challenges with food in Chinese history. There's basically yeah. been a famine every other year in China for two thousand years, two thousand five hundred years. It just it's bad. Like in the United States, we've never even had a famine. We don't even know what famine really means. Mm -hmm. China does. So food security, just getting food at all into people's bellies is a, is a hard thing. So the, so, well, bring it back to like normal food and what I ate, a lot of rice, a lot of these things are just uh, kind of whatever is cheapest and whatever you have around, right? China, you, you, eat, you eat basically everything. One of the first things I ate in Hong Kong when I first got there, I didn't, I didn't exactly read the, the menu early on well that my pure yeah. book learning at that time wasn't great. I ended up with an internal organs only soup. Oh, wow. Uh, which, that, that, you know, obviously internal <laughs> organs are actually seen as very healthy uh, in China uh -huh. and a lot of other cultures. But for me, I, at that time, I was like, oh God, what is this? They eat everything. Do you just eat everything here, right? Because like, we don't even have that kind of stuff. And that was one of the first things I was experiencing was like, kind of like the old adage about Native Americans, how many of the tribes would eat every, use every piece of the animal. They like, they would use the skin, use the bones, mm -hmm. eat every part of the meat, all the tendons, all right. the ligaments. Mm -hmm. I had that same sense in China where everything was eaten. And I would be at a university, uh, I was at a university cafe and I, I'd see like all the rice being eaten in the bowls. That, that was a similar sort of thing. Not every rice, but I also ran out of money briefly because I had a credit card problem. I was literally eating each grain of rice because that was the, <laughs> the only thing I could get right at that moment. Wow, do you, do you think that philosophy um... How, how long has that been around? Have they always um, eaten everything? Is it more of like a respect for being grateful for the whole thing? Or is it more of a, a necessity of not having enough? 
So you get whatever you have. Oh, definitely a necessity of not having enough. So America, so in the 1930s, there was a movie called, in a book before called, I think it was called The Good Earth. It was about yeah. how, <laughs> yeah. And so for a long time, for decades, American mothers would tell their children, uh, finish your food. You know, there's people starving in China, basically. Right. And that is more of the, the gra be grateful. You know, you have all this food, finish it as a sign of, of that gratitude. In China, it was very different. It is, we need the food, eat it because we, ha we have limited supplies. So the American side was more the gratitude. China was more, modern China is more the practical need, but there is also, food is also connected to that whole other world of balancing internal organs and in, in chi and energy and the yin yang right. and the universe, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. I, obviously I'm not gonna, getting into chi, yin yang, the five energies, this is obviously way too much, but like, <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that, that world exists, right? So Yeah, that's really interesting. I wonder if they shifted their mindset of not having that scarcity and were more grateful for it if things would come more in abundance to them. Well, unfortunately, in China now, you have the problem in the United States where you have <laughs> one of the calorie abundance we have in the United States. The problem is we get, we get obesity, we get all of these challenges. And Historically, there's been very little obesity in China for obvious reasons. Uh, obviously, there's the upper class and stuff. But yeah, in the last 15 years, it's become a bigger and bigger problem. And it's been a real change and challenge. And, you know, in, in many ways, our, our bodies and our minds, we're not totally, we don't know how to deal with a lot of food in general. I think when like those mothers were trying to tell people, be grateful for the food, we're trying to impart a certain consciousness to how we eat and why we eat, which is just sort of as we've lost sort of spiritual religious connections to these teachings, to, the, to any teachings at all, uh, we, all we have is this material food and we have a lot of it. We have bodily systems telling us to eat more of it. And I think trying to regain some sense of the connection, whether it comes to gratitude, a generic, more general gratitude, uh, whether it comes to a spiritual connection to what this type of food does to one internal system, how it relates to any of that, all of it is very valuable because our sort of connection to food has become a challenge. And you just, I see that in China now where you'll have, you know, there's frequently local governments, everyone are raging against, you know, you know rates of obesity and stuff. And it's, it's, it's never been seen before. China didn't have the calories in the country to have that many uh, people who were <laughs> overweight. So it's just a, it's another sign of just the, the speed at which things change. Fascinating. If you could share like one message or truth about China, what would it be? Mm. One message of truth. Uh, what would it be? Yeah, <laughs> no, I guess I would. I think the most valuable one is, is that the, 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 there's a deep value. Basically, an entire civilization has pushed itself to try to find an ideal or optimal balance between you know, order and chaos in their being, their social being, right? Group being, family life, individuals. I think that there is a similar value for people to find a sort of creative duality in their own life, right? In a lot of the world, and particularly the West, we have a push towards the perfectibility of us as a one single unitary person, right? And, you know, we know we're in many ways, many, many people all at once, right? Conscious mind doing one thing, we have, a, you know, an unconscious thing doing all sorts of other things. We have many different pieces and fragments. And we you obviously, we definitely want to be pushing towards a unified sense of self, but we also have to realize that a lot of the creative potential and the dynamism comes from, you know, the, the an interplay of, of forces, right? An interplay of you know, cre creative potentials of whether it's a sort of, you know, creative generative force within us and more of a sort of uh, organizing, structuring, rigid force. I don't want to get, in, I mean, you can see there's a, <laughs> you can, one common way to translate it is, is, is sort of a masculine feminine type right, thing. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's it's value. It's a very it's a very profound moment for me when I realized just how deep all of this went, right? In China, when I realized that you know it's not just a weird symbol. It's not just this. It, it goes you know it was really profound. And I think that the very fact that a whole civilization has never achieved this balance yet it strive for it for so long, it's also something very profound about that. And we could say it's fruitless and pointless. I mean, but that's like saying oh I want to be a perfect person. It's like well that's also fruitless <laughs> and pointless. But but I think. Yeah, I think that is a big message that that trying to find a sort of balanced or like uh, empowered sort of form of creative duality within us. There's something real in that. Chinese history and civilization says 
might be worth doing. Uh, that's my message, I guess. Okay. Is that something you feel like you've been able to integrate within yourself? I think, I think so. I think, I think there are periods when, yeah, I think, I think I've just found increasingly that there's no other way to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. I think if you're going from, you know, writing a, a book, for example, where it's all super linear, super structured, super intense and dense and like that sort of stuff to suddenly you're having a free flowing conversation with a close friend, right. Or whatever there's, we're always being pulled in and out of these modes. And I think we get into a place where we're sort of overemphasizing one often it's just because we have a job that requires us to do that, or we're doing some project or task that requires us to do that, or we just enjoy one mode so much. You're like, wow, I could just be talking to or like Oprah all day. Like, right. Like, uh, right. you know, it's like, that just sounds lovely. Like who, who wouldn't want to do that? Uh, but then I, I think what happens is that what I've learned is that whenever I push too far in one direction, other things feel, start to feel dead, extinct, sterile, uh, like negated yeah. or something in, inside of you. And it's that same problem. Whereas just, I've also learned if you just push yourself to be this perfect vision of yourself, but it's only one part of yourself, you get close to that. You start to feel like all sorts of other things about you are lost and gone and forgotten. And it feels mm. very weird. Oh, so wow. you're always, yeah. I, this one metaphor I really liked, I heard, you know, once, once you're an adult, we, when we were kids, we we're like, I got to go to school. I got to do this. It's like, or I have to be, I have to you know, get a spouse. I have to get a mother. I have to get a perfect body. I have to do this. I have to do that. Once you're really an adult, you, you realize that the only way to grow is to grow all at once. It's like to grow like a tree, right? It doesn't grow. Mm -hmm. It grows in every direction all at once. It's growing up, it's growing out, it's growing down. And that's kind of how it has to happen. And I think that it only happens when you have, you know, you know, within, within the circle, there's multiple forces, but they're somehow all unified together and intention in some ways, but interacting, interrelating, and it prevents that sort of holistic growth. Yeah, there's that balance again. <laughs> there's that balance again. Excellent. Well, you obviously have so much wisdom within you about all of these things. And there's so much more that you contain, I know, but we're running out of time. So where can people find your book? And where can they listen to your podcast and be able to dive deeper? Yeah, sure. So uh, my website has you know, www.jasonshafter.com has articles, stuff like that, mostly for people who are interested in the more spiritual side that you'll have to find, you have to wait for it probably. <laughs> uh, but more of the, the state of the world as we know it, uh, that that's there. Uh, podcast, you can find it wherever you get podcasts. It's called, it's called China Unraveled. There's also a YouTube channel where I just do sort of quick live streams and increasingly I'll probably do more like Q and A and all sorts of other stuff, but I just haven't had time. The book is currently being revised. That is my day, day life of basically living in a cave and revising this book, but you'll be able to get it pretty soon. It'll probably also be called uh, China. Unra Actually, the full title is probably China Unraveled Order and Chaos in East Asia. So there's that balance. Again, question of balance. That's the, the highest level typically it's thought of in China's order and chaos. So there's that. And anything else? Where else can you find me? That's good. Those are good places. YouTube, podcasts, internet. Okay. There's Twitter at Jason Scheftel, and that's most of it. I am so. not really on Instagram, but okay, cool. I like people who are. Uh, I will add all of those links into the show notes so people can click on them very easily. And I do have one question that I usually ask to wrap up the conversation. Um, but because we're talking about something so specific, I'm going to ask hmm. you two different things so you Ooh, can cool. answer them separately. So if China's inner voice had a billboard, what would it say to the world? Oh, what would it say? Fight for balance, something like that. Yeah. And if your inner voice had a billboard, what would it say to the world? Mm, girl like a tree, I like that. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, it was great. Thank you so much for joining me this week. If you're listening and you like what you hear, please consider subscribing and rating this podcast as it really helps get this podcast out to other people who might be interested in hearing it but don't know about it yet. And also, if you'd like to contact me or reach me, you can reach me at unconditioningpodcast at gmail.com or unconditioningpodcast on Instagram. Thank you so much. And until next time, stay tuned in to you. <laughs>